My guest tonight is the author of the New York Times bestselling Rad Women series. Her latest book is called Rad American History A to Z. She's also a fierce advocate for social justice who's shedding light on racism, feminism, politics, and the responsibilities of white people in the world today. As if, wow, I think that covers everything. I don't think we need to do an interview now. Please welcome John. Kate Schatz. Hi, Kate. Hi, Hi Conan. How uh, are you? Thank you for being here. And let me explain our, our trajectory uh, to anyone who may not know. Um, right after uh, the killing of George Floyd, we had two weeks of discussions on my show, uh, tr trying to just open it up, talk to a lot of different people. One of the first people I talked to uh, was W. Kamau Bell, who's uh, a, a friend of mine over the years, a guy I know and, and trust, and I thought, Let's, let's have this conversation. And one of the first things he did in his interview was said, Conan, I'm going to assign you, what was the word he used? A whiteness counselor? I think so. I think he said that I was gonna be in charge of your whiteness. In charge of my whiteness. And um, first of all, I thought, I pity whoever's in charge of my whiteness because <laughs> that is a lot of whiteness to be in charge of. So much, yeah. blinding. Yeah, and then I thought, um, I got confused because I thought, well, wait, is this person you're assigning me to, it, it, if she's there to help me be more white, it's not necessary. No. But apparently that's, that's not what it was all about. And we uh, have started up a bit of a dialogue, you and I, mm -hmm. and I've been looking through your books and I'm very impressed. But tell me, when, uh, when our mutual friend said, whiteness counselor or you're in charge of my whiteness how did you interpret that <laughs> and uh so i interpreted that as you know it's it was kind of an offshoot of a conversation that Kamau and i had had um you know earlier that week so in the in the wake of the murder of george floyd and the uprising around racial justice that we saw and experienced and are still experiencing Kamau texted me and said <laughs> you know basically he was like hey, all these rich, powerful white people with tons of privilege keep asking me, what do I do? Uh, and he was like, I don't know what to tell them. Can I send them to you? Is there like a website y'all have like for white people? Like what, what do I do with them? And I wrote him back and I was like, yes, send them my way. Come out, of course, like you don't need to deal with that right now. Um, right. I did not expect the first person uh, for him to send my way to be you. Yes, um, it happened immediately. And it's the worst news you ever got. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it was great, and and you know, but what I really saw it as was, was an opportunity to do what I think I've always tried to do, which is you know leverage my platform and my privilege to make some kind of impact, um, whether it's right. through my books or through uh, teaching, which I did for many years, or through just having conversations. So I thought, well. I've got a lot of new followers on Twitter and on Instagram. Um, and I really believe that in this particular moment, white people have a lot of questions and, and they deserve to be able to ask them. Um, they're yeah. not great questions, no, but, no. but there's a lot of confusion and there, there it was and is still a lot of, what do I do? What's the most effective thing to do? What's happening? Um, those questions don't need to be directed necessarily to your black friends and colleagues and neighbors. Um, so I was like, well, I'll just get on Instagram and ask people to send me their questions and we'll just start talking. And I got hundreds of questions, I still do. Um, and I've been doing my best to answer them, um, honestly. So many people, and I'm gonna include myself, who uh, feel like, oh my God, I don't wanna make a mistake. Yeah. I, I want to be an ally. I want to move the peace forward. I want to be the solution and not part of the problem. But I'm terrified of making a mistake. Mm -hmm. And that leads to, I think, a paralysis mm -hmm. that is not helping. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. You know, and I, I, I like kind of using the term, you know, uh, co conspirators or accomplices. Uh, rather than allies, you know, uh, right. but those folks are the people who've made mistakes uh, and who've heard the feedback, learned and kept going, right? Um, that, that paralysis is, it's, you know, it's really, really, I think actually really selfish um, and, and incredibly unhelpful. You will, so the question isn't, what do I do if I say the wrong thing? It's what, when I do this or say the wrong thing, what's the best way for me to respond in that moment?
You know, we're all gonna mess up. And it's not just around race. Men are gonna say the wrong thing to women. We're gonna misgender people. We're all, you know, we are right. all gonna do and say the wrong thing and cause someone harm so often in a way that we're absolutely not meaning to. And that's so often what people say is, well, that wasn't my intention. Like, right. well, I, I didn't mean that, I didn't, that wasn't my intention. But if, but if something that you do or say harms someone uh, and, and they let you know that, what you need to be able to do is listen to them and hear them and understand how you can do better the next time. You know, if, and if we just let that paralysis, uh, you know, take over and we just don't say anything, uh, you know, that's, that's, <laughs> that's part of the large systemic problem that we have. The, um, obviously a lot of people talking about uh, the book, uh, White Fragility, which I believe was written about a year or two ago, but, you know, immediately became uh, this, th this uh, very sought after book uh, after the killing of George Floyd and, and people talking about, well, discussing what's in there. What I found was really interesting was in that book, there's addressing this idea that um, white people have so much fear and sensitivity about race yeah. that we're afraid to make a mistake. And then you think about it, you think, well, a faux pas is a small price to pay for trying to engage. Meaning if the price that I'm gonna have to pay to educate myself and to grow and evolve is to be embarrassed a bunch of times, that is less than the size of an atom compared to the Himalayan mountains, which are hundreds of years of racial discrimination. So get over it. I think I encourage people to think of, well, what's the worst thing that can happen, right? right. If, you, if you put on a Black Lives Matter t-shirt or you put a sign in your window or mm -hmm. you take the step to bring something up to a family member and that's like, you know, might, might be uncomfortable or awkward or even really contentious, what's the worst thing that can happen and what are you willing to risk for something that you believe? Um, you know, and I think that what I want to encourage people to do is if, you know, is to get clear on your beliefs. If you believe uh, that we have a history of systemic racism in this country. If you believe that black and brown people are disproportionately mistreated by police, uh, if you believe these things, if you believe that Black Lives Matter, then you know what are you willing to risk to talk about that and to share that message with people in your community? In some ways, very simple, and yet clearly we talk about, there's the paralysis and fear that we see in this country about people worried to make a mistake. And then the flip side, what I want to ask you about is defensiveness. Yeah, It's a very simple thing to go, I don't know, maybe I did, maybe I did make a mistake. Maybe I was biased. Maybe, maybe uh, how could I not be biased? Let's talk about it. It's such a simple thing to do, but, but people put up this defensive wall and it's that defensiveness I think is the hardest thing to get over. It is, and you know, to what I like to, you know, I kind of like to turn it around and say like, well, what exactly are you defending? You know, when you get that upset um, because we've had this conversation and it's, that's the thing. It's not just about getting accused of doing something that is seen as racist, you know, people will be furious that you and I are actually having this conversation. Um, you know, so for those people, it's like, what, what are you so upset about? How is this harming you? What exactly are you defending? Um, are you just defending white supremacy? Are you defending, um, you know, uh, that that position? Um, right. Yeah, it's it's the defensiveness is huge, and I, I you know I, I really appreciate um, you know you I appreciate you having me on, and I appreciate you being willing to have this conversation after the fact, right? Because I think that in all these conversations that we have about what white people can be doing and be better and all this stuff, I think accountability and follow up is a huge part of it, right? So we can have these conversations in the weeks after these horrific things happen, but then we kind of go back to normal, right? Yeah, I, I was gonna show, um, like, I don't have it as a, but I was gonna hold up my phone and say, we are very much uh, a society that's like, what are we talking about now? Mm -hmm. So uh, right now it's Trump's getting impeached and that's all anybody wants to talk about and then, we move on and then it's COVID and then we move on and then George Floyd is killed and uh, everybody says, this is now what we're gonna talk about. And you think this is fantastic. And it's not that people are consciously saying, dismissing it as an issue, but then COVID resurges and we move on. And then that is, I think the issue is so much good 
uh, or dialogue, so much good dialogue and so much raw emotion was vented in the last two months that you think let's, a, a sort of a path has been opened. I don't think we've ever seen sustained mm -hmm. anger and concern like that in my lifetime. Yeah. Um, I'm 28. Yeah, uh, I know. You're, you're a lot younger than me, so. Yeah, yeah, I just, it's sun damage. Um, <laughs> but we haven't seen this. And yeah, this is a, an opportunity to keep the path open and keep exploring. So you're right. I mean, I, I, I do think it's essential to not say, well, check. Mm -hmm. We did racism. Yeah, right. We pulled, down, we pulled down a bunch of statues and um, I think we're good. Let's yeah. move on because- yeah. We haven't moved on, you know, the Brianna Taylor's killers are still uh, still walking free and um, there's still people in, in Louisville who've been protesting every single day for months, getting arrested and, and not relenting. And so, you know, I think sometimes what happens too is that for, especially with, you know, white people, if it's not immediately in your feed and in your immediate, in front of your face, in your feed, and you think, oh, it's not, it doesn't exist anymore. So I think, uh, you know, the, the level at which we saw the kind of protests happening all over all the time constantly, um, that's still happening in a lot of places. Um, it just might not be showing up in your feed. So, um, you know, be sure to be diversifying your feed and paying attention to it because it's all still happening. But I think you're right that there is a path that's open and this is a time for people to really be thinking critically about how do you stay on that path? Now, it doesn't mean that everything you do now has to be completely uh, you know, all about racial justice, unless that's the work that you really want to be doing. I've been watching everybody you've had on, and you've had great people on that I love, and you've had some incredible conversations with your Black guests that you've had on. Well, what happens when Will Ferrell comes on? I love Will. You know, what does it look like when, in addition to his new movie, you also say, hey, like, how are you feeling about, you know, the changes in society? What, how, right. did, the, how did the killing of George Floyd affect you, you know, Will, or Rob Lowe or whatever person's on. Um, and that's where there's like a real, that's unexpected. And I think that's where the, the needle starts to get moved, you know, and it's goes back to that idea about discomfort. Like that's why people do not expect to be asked about race <laughs> because we don't right. see ourselves as part of race. We often see racism as something that happens to other people who do not look like us and we didn't do it, right? But we are actually totally complicit and right. white supremacy uh, impacts us all negatively, so. No, I, I mean, I think that's a really good point. I think it's, what's interesting about it is the concept that when you're, when you're talking to people, and this is something where I honestly don't know the answer, but where I'm talking to people in entertainment about their project is then figuring out a way to do it which doesn't look like a gotcha, doesn't look like um, I've, you know, uh, and, and also asking them, they may have very visceral, strong feelings about it and they may not be prepared to talk about that. So there needs to be a way to figure out how can I, how, how can that be part of the conversation ongoing without it looking like I'm trying to make people uncomfortable? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but you always are kind of making people uncomfortable, you know. That's just my appearance. That's, <laughs> that's, that's true. true. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do anything about that. No, I can't believe we've been having to look at this for so long. Um, the thin lips and the eyes and, uh, yeah. No, but I, I, I agree that, um, that there needs to be many different ways. Like, one of the approaches that... I've wanted to take is how can I, not even so much as a person with whatever kind of platform I have, I'm always wary of my platform because I think my, and I think I should be wary of my platform because I, I'm not even comfortable with the word. I, I feel like I'm someone who has some ability at being silly and that has brought me into people's homes for a long period of time. And so I'm wary of leaning against it like the most important thing to me has been how do I personally, how do I evolve? How do I change the culture that's my ecosystem around me? How can I improve it? How can I make changes that, and, and sort of lead by example? Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. You know, taking inventory of, of who's working for you. You know, by the way, everybody you work with that I've interacted with so far has been the nicest people ever. So 
Good job. Love them all. Um, I've, I've tried to fire them, but they have legal protections, ah, which infuriates me. You know, labor movement. Uh, what I yeah. really want, what I really want is a staff of shitheads, but I yeah. legally don't know how to, how to pull it off. I don't know how to do it. Um, I'm, I'm sure you could find a lawyer who could help you figure that one out. Um, yeah. No, I think that, you know, like whether it's looking around at who are you employing, who are you working with, who are you hiring, what does your writing room look like, you know, who are you bringing in, and what does yep. it like to be yep. intentional about that, you know, but um, but I wanted to say that the idea of how do you bring up those conversations in ways that don't feel like a gotcha, you know, I, again, I think Black entertainers have been there, that's what they do. I watched the wonderful Nicole Byer when you had her on. She's hilarious. And she talked both about the pain and the challenge of this moment. And she also talked about her amazing new book. You know, she, she, what's uh, uh, great is when I, I, I love so many people are, we have a, a writer on our staff, Lori Kilmartin, who's very good at talking about she just lost her mother to COVID. And she was able to take that pain and 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 braid it, entwine it with humor in this way that was like a razor's edge. Yeah. And I think uh, Chris Red from Saturday Night Live was on, and he was, um, you know, he's he can be so funny where he's walking the razor's edge of he he can bring up being afraid of hearing someone be racist when he's playing a video game and they don't know who he is and maybe someone's gonna, you know shout out the n-word uh, and and not know that he's there. But he was very funny talking about that in a way that it's such a powerful weapon to be funny and bring up the biggest nuclear bomb issue in American history for the last 250 years wow. and somehow combine the two. Those, I mean, it's so many entertainers are so good at doing that. Um, and I think that's a very powerful tool as well. And I think that's, you know, that's what I've always loved about Kamau and his work is how he does, you know, yeah, comedy is an incredibly powerful tool and uh, you can, you know, you can do so much. You can go places and have conversations that people ordinarily would be too afraid to go to. Um, Conan, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, yeah. I'd love to hear what you've been learning. Uh, you know, you wrote me a wonderful email and really laid out a lot of things you've been thinking about. So I'd love for you to tell the class um, about some of the work <laughs> you've been doing. Well, I got stoned. I didn't write the paper. <laughs> <laughs> then I wrote something, but my dog ate it. And uh, uh -huh. yeah, no, um, what, I mean, we talked a little bit about it, but one of the things is you, there's a, I'm a, I love to read. So the first thing that I did, and I didn't want it to feel like I'm doing a good job and doing my assignment. I really wanted it to feel like I want to do this for me. You yeah. know, I want to. So um, one of the first things I read, and I was ashamed that I hadn't read it before because it's a book that's been around my whole life, is the autobiography of Malcolm X. And um, it is one of the most harrowing stories, personal stories that you're ever going to read. Uh, it's, it is, a, and, and it takes place in Roxbury, which is right near where I grew up. Mm. And it, obviously, uh, Malcolm X is growing up, uh, in the 1940s and fifties in Roxbury and then moving to Harlem. But that transformation is absolutely incredible. And you can't read that book and not see that this person, uh, I think his, his father dies violently. Uh, at the hands of racists, and his whole life is all about the color of his skin, and it completely. And he's obviously incredibly intelligent, and incredibly talented, and incredibly good-looking, and charismatic. And it's you see how his entire life mm -hmm. is is changed by uh, institutional racism, and you completely understand his point of view by the time you get to. 1960, 61, and he's 62, and he's saying, look, I am I respect Dr. Martin Luther King and peaceful protests and everything, but you, you understand how we got to any means necessary. You completely understand it. So there's things as simple as uh, reading a, a book. There's also tons of conversations you can be having, mm -hmm. and there are ways that you can think about how can I take my little world and make changes in it that will, for me and for the people around me, uh, advance adv advance this movement a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, 
and and it's we've had a lot of talks about it with my producer and with people on the show just talking about you know what can we do what can we do in the makeup of our show what can we do in uh and and talking not just with the show but my wife and my kids what can we be doing day in and day out and one of the nice things is if my kids are any example one is 16 my daughter's 16 and my son's 14 they're absolutely um it's a generation and 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 their friends as well they're very very interested in making this world better and rate and racially fairer than than it has been they're very i mean it's not the top of their list and so that's inspiring that's hopeful now uh i did send your family shirts that match the one i'm wearing uh mm -hmm. Yep. Did the, did the kids get the Black Lives Matter uh, care package? Yes, they did, and I got your Black Lives Matter shirt as well. There you go, Conan. Um, and uh, you know, I and this leads me to my next question, which is, I don't have a confusion about this. I want to make that clear, but there has been a common refrain uh, among certain people in this country. I think I know where you're going with this one. That say Black Lives Matter, well, all lives matter. Mm. And I have a point of view about that, a very strong point of view about that, but why don't you tell us what you see the distinction being? Um, yeah, that's that's just not something that I debate, you know? Right. Uh, <laughs> that's just not a debate. Um, and, you know, I think the way that I, I actually, I do touch on that, here in this book I wrote. Oh, look, you have your own book with you right there. It's a super coincidence. Um, I didn't even realize it was right here. <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, this is so lucky. I'm, I'm so uh -huh. lucky. Um, uh, and actually, in this book, again, which is an A to Z book of radical moments and movements from American history, many of which we don't learn about in schools, um, B is for Black Lives Matter. Um, mm -hmm. And it's about the three women who founded the movement. Um, and I actually address that. So I'm just going to read my paragraph about that. All right. Um, where I say, some non-Black people feel threatened or left out by the phrase Black Lives Matter. What about us, they've argued. Why single out Black lives? Don't all lives matter? The answer is yes. Of course, every human life matters. But until all humans are actually treated equally in this country, it is justified and vital to bring attention to certain groups who have been routinely, statistically, and historically harmed. That is my succinct, uh, kind of succinct explanation. In other I, words, well, it's, no, it, it's very good. I just was having a, uh, a sense memory. No one's read to me uh, since I was about five, and it was and it was fantastic. And uh, eyes glazed over. You started to nap. No, 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 no. Much no, they didn't glaze over, but uh, much better content than the stuff they were reading me when I was five. No, I could. We could do this. I could. I could zoom with you at night and, and read all these stories. <laughs> What if my wife, my wife's going to walk in and go, who's that woman oh, that you're talking to at, at three o'clock in the morning? And I'll be like, no, no, we're talking about race. And she'll say, yeah, okay, I want a divorce. <laughs> well, you know, it's, I will say one thing I found in, in writing these books, because the books that, that I write with my collaborator, Miriam Kleinstahl, um, they're aimed at young readers, um, but I do a lot of school visits while in in the before times I would go into classrooms a lot um and I always love to read to young people but I, I love reading to high school students and college students and I'll read to adults we all really like to be read to so um so yeah that's 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 my answer um Black no, but I, I, I had the same feeling which is uh I mean immediately which is the reason uh the state the statement Black Lives Matter comes out of this uh, incredibly undeniable, this incredible undeniable history of neglect. That's why the statement needs to be made yeah. in the first. So, so then to say, look, well, wait a minute. No, all lives matter is to deny that we have an issue. <laughs> we, we have a specific racial issue in this country. Yeah. And at this point also, you know, at this point in the conversation, in the movement, in our country, at this point, to say all lives matter, that is an expressly violent and racist statement at this point. Uh, we're beyond context. In fact, here where I live, I live in Alameda, California, right next to Oakland. Um, several black families in town recently woke up to find their cars vandalized. Their tires had been slashed, they'd been keyed, and All Lives Matter and ALM had been spray painted all over the cars. This is in the, the liberal Bay Area. So that's, it's, 
it, we're beyond the conversation of, of debating whether black, whether the phrase yeah, is yeah, yeah. And, 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 you know, Black Lives Matter. And again, I talk about it in the book. It, that phrase began with conversations amongst three black women who were friends, who were feeling unbelievable rage and sorrow when George Zimmerman was acquitted of the murder of Trayvon Martin. And they literally just typed on Facebook, I feel like black lives don't matter. And then they turned that in and said, you know what? Black lives do matter. Black lives matter. And they started that as a hashtag initially to, to share love and to uplift their community. Uh, and then as it caught on, they were like, wow, this maybe is a movement. And then they've built it into a global movement. And um, those women are Alicia Garza, Opal, Janetti and Patrice Colors, and they have been propelling this, um, you know, and it's, uh, it's, it's an important phrase. We put it on the cover of the book too. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, I, and I do, one of the things when I first started doing these Instagram lives after I received my promotion to um, being in charge of your whiteness. Uh, it's uh, a, was, trust me, it's a demotion. Well, I, ha I wasn't working a lot because of quarantine. So I, I, was, I had some time. You take the jobs that come your way. Seriously. Yeah. So, but one of the first things I talked to people about was, you know, if you're wondering what to do right now, as you're grappling with what can I do, what do I read, which book, get a piece of paper, write Black Lives Matter on it and tape it up in your window, you know? Mm -hmm. And if you can't take that step, if you're a white person and you're not ready to do that, to make your support visible, then there's a lot more kind of deep work that you have to do and, and, and that could maybe show you what you need to do. But if you could do that, um, it actually, it does have an impact. I've been hearing a lot of really powerful stories of, of how that, that show of solidarity and support um, has had so much meaning to so many people. Um, the last thing I wanted to bring up was uh, something that all of us are grappling with right now. Talking to someone uh, who doesn't agree with you, wanting to uh, change their perception maybe convince them. And it feels like we're in a place in our country where someone's with you or they're not. Someone's in your group or they're in the other group. And I'm just saying this as a, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to address everybody with this. Yeah. If you're a rabid Trump supporter uh, or if you think he's the antichrist, mm -hmm. how can we get to a place where we can talk about these things you can't shout someone down and yell at them and intimidate them into agreeing with you uh, about some of these issues. So what do you do? Yeah, it's the, uh, it's the, <laughs> it's the age old question. Um, I think you make, you make strategic smart choices that conserve your energy and protect your humanity. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and also are good uses of your energy. Right, um, and so I think that sometimes, um, I will say that I've never, ever, ever seen an argument be won in a Facebook thread. No, have you ever seen that happen? No. I've never seen online anyone go, you know what, I've been thinking about it, mm -hmm. and you're right, UFOs don't exist. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there can be, when you really believe something and you're seeing not stuff online, it's very tempting to get into it. I, at this point in my world, I don't do that. Your hair looks great, right. by the way. It's incredible. Um, you know, I think that should be the most important thing everyone takes away from this conversation. It is, it is. It Conan's is. hair and then race relations in America. I have my priorities straight. Yeah, you know, maybe you could like, we could like spray paint Black Lives Matter onto your hair, then it could just be always there, right? Okay, all right, we can do that. It would um, be sort of an orange. Sometimes I found for people who have family members, um, especially maybe older generation family members who they're, they want to be able to connect with over this, but it's hard. Sometimes connecting through history, um, through like historical events can be a kind of way in um, to get to those conversations. And I also think that we have to accept that we're just not gonna change everybody's mind. Um, and I don't think, I don't, there's people who disagree with me. I do not think that you, that we are under, an, that we are obligated to get into long drawn out conversations with people who don't respect the basic humanity of the people that we love, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that said, I think that if you do see someone online who, you know, and you, you want to engage with them or, or it's a family member, asking people if they're willing to talk to you offline, you know, hey, I have a different opinion and I'd be really interested in sharing about like what I believe. Would you ever be willing to talk to me 
you know, privately or on the phone, you know, um, right. uh, and, and if you can come, I mean, I think that for people who are interested in having those conversations, learning the basics of nonviolent communication is incredibly helpful because I agree with you. You're not going to shout people down, you know, and no. it can go from zero to like 10 million so quickly because people yes. get so upset. Especially right, especially right now. I mean, yeah. it's always been that way, but right now it feels definitely like a powder keg and we're seeing every day. We talked about this before on social media. People have even taken wearing masks, face masks as a basic protection. They've, somehow made that an issue that they've tied to, uh, you know, um, race or uh, uh, income, wealth. They've tied it to all this other stuff, freedom, uh, government versus no government. And it's just like, no, no, just put on a mask. It's really simple. Just put on a mask. But no, that's what we've we've if 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 people are losing it over wearing a piece of paper over their mouth for the 10 minutes that they're at a costco yeah. we see what's going to happen when you're implying that they're part of a racist system that needs to be uh that needs to be fixed they're going to really lose it that's where you choose your battles, right? That's where you choose, is this gonna be worth the energy that it's gonna take me? And could I use my energy elsewhere? I'll tell you that, you know, a lot of people that I talk to who have struggled with really racist family members, you, the aunt and uncle, grandma, grandpa, the parents, they may be far gone, but those nieces and nephews, those little cousins, you know? Right. Send them my books, <laughs> yeah. you know, have those conversations, like you said about your kids, like they're a different generation. So sometimes I think maybe it's if you're the aunt connecting with that niece or nephew um, in a way that doesn't like, you know, yeah. your parents, but uh, <laughs> I don't talk to any of my relatives. That's how I take care of it. That's all my manager talks to everyone for me. You know, he, says, he tells me they're lovely people. <laughs> the, the other thing I'd say is, Sometimes I think about talking to people who don't get it or who you disagree with. You know, it's almost like talking to my almost seven-year-old son where I have to remind myself that we're gonna have a lot of conversations where what I say in the moment may not seem to change anything with him, but it's gonna sink in over time. Right. And I think that it's still worth doing your best to share resources, recommend books, recommend documentaries, maybe the back and forth on Facebook isn't going to change anything, but like, maybe you can get that aunt to listen to the 1619 podcast, you know, or yep. to watch when they see us or to watch 13th, you know, maybe just putting those resources out there. Um, maybe that can work with someone over time and they might not change their mind in the moment that you're in the conversation, oh. but some stuff could sink in. That's how I feel about parenting basically at all times. <laughs> right. Well, uh, I appreciate this conversation a lot. I like to be an optimist, and I I, uh, I like to know that good people are out there trying to do good work. And so okay. I'm- uh, uh, Wait, I have one more question. I know we're, we're done, but uh, I am curious to know, like, what is one thing that you learned from my book that you were like fascinated to learn as a history buff that you didn't know before? Well, I'm, 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 I'm gonna say Maya Lin. What I didn't know was that Maya Lin was in college when she designed the Vietnam Memorial and that she got that much opposition to it and that she fought back. What college student who was told, yes, we're going to build your monument, we just need you to make a few changes says, I don't think so, it's good yeah. the way it is. And then it turned out to be such a stunning success. That's one of the coolest, uh, I mean, the book's, the book's filled with very amazing stories. That was the one that stuck with me because I was so shocked that someone that young, um, it just had the guts and temerity and vision and then saw it all the way through. And then it turned into a massive success in her lifetime, immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Not, like Van, not like Van Gogh, like where, okay, maybe he's a ghost somewhere and he's appreciating and his stuff is making a lot of money. He's a one-eared ghost, but uh, yeah, I, I really love that. Excellent, Van Ghost. Van Ghost, exactly. All right, I'll, I'll do the comedy here. Let's see. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, as I said, Kate's book is called Rad American History A to Z. It's available now. And uh, Kate Chops, thank you very much for doing this. Thank you, Kuhn, and you're doing a good job. I'm very proud of you.